It was built in 1908 and operated for almost 100 years before it closed for repairs. Today, this is the remodeled Teatro Colon, the Buenos Aires Opera House that was for many years the epicenter of performing arts in the Americas. Considered among the most acoustically perfect theaters in the world, it was the venue chosen by the most important acts of the 20th century. And in the 1940s, it was home to a company that was known as the most revolutionary of its time. Long before social media helped us connect or even television exposed us to new talents, this group engineered collaborations with choreographers, composers, artists, and fashion designers. They dazzled fans around the world, joined by the greats of the time, like Picasso, Matisse, and Coco Chanel. They were the Ballet Ruse, the Paris-based Russian ballet, and they revitalized a fading art form. A traveling exhibit celebrating their story began three years ago at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and it recently stopped here in Washington, D.C. Joe Zarenko takes us there. They were a dance sensation like no other. Dazzling audiences around the globe with a fusion of movement, art, and music that had never before been seen. And changing the course of ballet forever. When the Ballet Russe came to Paris, it was a complete revelation. Sarah Kennel is a curator at Washington's National Gallery of Art. First, uh, just the level of dancing, the quality of dancing, was so much higher than what had been performed on the stages um, in Paris. Ballet had really lost its status as a high art form. It had become a place to go see um, young, beautiful women in short tutus. It was almost a kind of variety show. Through their work, artistic expression evolved and provided world culture with a moment of transcendence. One of the things that they accomplished was a kind of unification of the arts that hadn't existed before in the ballet stage. The idea that um, a costume would complement the choreography, the choreography and the decor would work together, the musicians would work very closely with the dancers and the designers to think about something as a total whole. So it was, this, it was this combination of everything that was new and putting it all together that really was a revelation. The creation of the company was the masterwork of a Russian attorney turned cultural entrepreneur named Serge Diaghilev. It's a funny thing to call them the Ballet Russe because, of course, they were founded by Russians, um, but they never performed in Russia. Uh, they found their home in Paris, and this was due to a number of factors. First, Diaghilev early on had funding from Russia to support the exportation of Russian culture um, abroad. So he chose Paris, which really was the center of the art world. Diaghilev rethought creative collaborations. Diaghilev really brought in new talent, and he didn't bring in stage designers. He brought in artists who were working at the forefront of their craft. Top talent like Picasso, Matisse, and Coco Chanel partnered with the troupe. And he pushed them to think, you know, about their art in new ways. There was this sense of that you had to innovate, um, that that was the reputation of the Ballet Russe. The result was a creative explosion. The idea of a drop curtain as being like a canvas, like its own work of art, that was something particularly new. Natalia Goncharova's uh, bat cloth for the Firebird. It's so impressive. It's almost 40 by 50 feet. So it's a, one of the biggest canvases you, know, you, you might ever see. It's also in a gorgeous condition and it just glows. It, it's just an amazing thing to see. Over 130 costumes are showcased, many of which have not been seen since they were last worn on stage. Cleopatra's gown, the uniform of a warrior, a sorcerer's suit. 
Visuals produced or inspired by the Ballet Russe are also displayed. All the classic productions are represented, featuring settings that are surreal, futuristic, avant-garde, and exotic, like the Chinese kingdom from Song of the Nightingale. It's about a, an emperor who has um, this beautiful living nightingale who sings to him, um, but a mechanical nightingale comes along and um, he's so taken with this new creation that he casts off the living nightingale. Uh, and then he becomes very, very sick. The costumes were designed by Matisse. But above all, the dancers are the draw. The original company had come from the Russian Imperial Theater, so they were all classically trained dancers, and really very highly trained, very technically trained, with high kicks and leaps and pirouettes and turns. There were many stars, but one towered over the rest, Vaslav Nijinsky. Well, of course, you know, if we could be anywhere, you know, one of the places we'd like to be is to see Nijinsky dance. He was called an apparition, a wonder, a genius a machine of muscles and nerves with steel-like strength. It was said to watch him dance was a sight that was unforgettable. He was an incredible dancer. He really was almost superhuman in the sense that he could become anything on stage. He seemed to kind of transform himself to every role, but he also had immense technical gifts. He had these very powerful thighs that allowed him to jump very, very high. A writer wrote, he walked as tigers do, a cat-like harlequin, and there was no gesture he did not execute with glory. You know, he was electrifying, and he was a sex symbol for both men and women. And for Diaghilev, too. Nijinsky was his lover, and he both promoted Nijinsky, but also um, controlled him. Until Nijinsky, while on tour in Argentina, had enough. And when Nijinsky got married in 1913, completely unexpectedly, um, to a, a Hungarian, a, an aspiring dancer from Hungary, it shocked everybody and it deeply wounded Diaghilev. And so he jettisoned Nijinsky from the company. And that really was a major break in the history of the Ballet Russe. But Diaghilev, the cunning businessman, was not about to let a personal snarl impede his ambition. There's a great phrase that the French use for people like Diaghilev, monstre sacré, or sacred monster. And that's kind of what he was. People recognized he was a monster in many ways. And he, he sort of recognized it himself, too. He could be charming and also very domineering. And he would tell Stravinsky, for example, you know, to, to make something faster or to cut something out. The absolute ruler ensured the Ballet Russe thrived until 1929, the year Diaghilev died. Whatever you think about ballet, there's no denying their importance as a creative force on the evolution of entertainment and art. Um, it really was extraordinary, and um, I think its impact um, we can trace out in the history of ballet, in the history of theater, in Hollywood. So I think it's part and parcel of a kind of early 20th century revolution.